Yeah. Got my wife. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that because I, I have watched some of your videos, by the way, and I saw that your wife named herself as the owner and you're the CEO. Um, yeah, well, we started this together. And um, in fact, when we were on Shark Tank, we could talk about that if you like. Um, yeah, when some, at one point, Mark, you don't see this on the show, but Mark Cuban it. goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said you're married, but she owns it. What's up with that? So they're always trying to go, gotcha. And I said, yeah. I was an asset protection strategy. And he's like, no, okay. Yeah, you know, I, I watched, by the way, just not an hour ago, I watched uh, the little clip. I was, you know, I'm doing my homework, right? So I I watched it because I was curious to see what Shark Tank had to say. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, they all, obviously they all ditched you except for, uh, was it Kevin Leary's his name? Well, what happened? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, uh, just for anyone who watches it, you can find it at zeroshoes.com slash Shark Tank. Um, that, it aired 10 years ago, in a, well, like the end of January. Um, so 10 years ago, when we all we had was a do-it-yourself sandal making kit. Right, so right, keep that in right, mind. right. Um, and what happened... Uh, basically, you know, we had already done our homework about how to do the valuation. Shark Tank's weird. You do the valuation in a, in a weird way where you say, here's what I'm willing to offer. Here's what I want in exchange, right. which is not like any normal business transaction. Right. And so we were offering uh, 8% of the company for 400 grand. It was a $5 That's million right. dollar valuation. Right. At the time, we had done $520,000 in sales the previous year. About, you know, <clears> maybe, I don't remember what we had done total at that point about just shy of a million probably. Um, but we had talked to bankers, people who sold shoe companies, people who bought shoe companies, uh, VCs, private equity guys, and they were range, had a valuation range between 2 million and 10 million. So we knew that they were going to try and talk us down. So we wanted to start somewhere that was, that we could justify. And um, uh, both Robert and Damon went out because they said we, it was just too rich for their blood. Right. Cuban went out because he said what we were doing was a bubble. Clearly not true. Say, yeah. um, Barbara went out because she said she hated me from the moment she saw me because I reminded her of her ex-husband. Um, <laughs> to, to which, to which, when when uh, when the show aired, I tweeted to her and I said, "It's too bad you didn't invest. I could have used some of that money for plastic surgery." Yeah. And um, but you know what are you going to do with that one? And so and then Kevin, you know, just did a kind of high flyer and said, "All right, I'll give you the four hundred grand, but for half the company." And we just yeah. went, that's not going to happen. And so, in fact, when we left, when we got out of the tank, uh, they, the producers asked us, you know, what do you think of Kevin's offer? And now Kevin had been saying during the whole show, um, I get it. It's a bunch of de Indians running around the desert naked on peyote. I know what you're I doing. Know, I know. Yeah, now, yeah. now they cut out the on peyote part. Yeah. Uh, but when we when they said, what do you think of Kevin's offer? My wife said, if he thought we were going to give up half the company, he was the one on peyote. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, and when you finally decided not to accept it, he said, well, then you're dead to me. I'm yeah. Thinking, and, what a sweetheart you know, of a guy. Well, and what's funny, of course, uh, not of course, but what's funny is if you do a search, we're one of the most successful post Shark Tank companies. So what I can say legally, because we did, I, I can't reveal all of our um, current statistics because we're an SEC reporting company. We're not a public company, but we did a crowdfunding raise. So we are a reporting company. Right. So- uh, again, we did about 500 grand the year we were on the show. And last year we did $33.6 million. Nice. And, and nice. I can say that we've grown significantly since then. Nice. So nice. we're always on the list of, you know, things that the shark, in fact, CNBC has a new, a new thing of shark tank misses. And we were yeah. the first one that they highlighted. Awesome. Well, let, let me just, uh, uh, we've discussed this before, but I, I just want to reiterate for people that might be listening to this is that. I, you know, as I travel around doing what I do and I'm putting on clinics around the country and I have people coming to see me and um, I'm often referred to as the running guy, which, by the way, I hate that. Um, but um, Wait, why do you hate that? Well, because I just don't want to be pigeonholed, you know, because there's so many other things that I do. Wow. Right. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I focus a lot on that because it's a really important component of the athlete's training. You know, yeah. and you can't run, you can't win. And, and so. And I had shirts made, by the way, that said, you can't win if you run like shit. Uh, and, and it filled up the entire back of the shirt, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time focusing on running mechanics. And, yeah. and um, my belief system is very much akin, akin to your belief system. Ironically, I mean, we're two different kind of guys. But, I mean, I'm just saying that we're on the same page where um, people will say, what shoe should I wear? I get this all the time. What shoe should I wear? And, and I've, I've always been very reluctant to name a brand. Okay. Yeah. 
And back in the day, and you're familiar with this, and we I think we talked about this once upon a time, when Ultra first came out, they were all about broad toe box, firm shoe, you know, blah, 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 zero drop. And I thought, wow. It, at first, it looked at it looked crazy to me, but you know, I, I, I soon learned to find that it was a very intelligent approach to, to making a shoe. But they succumbed to the pressures of, you know, the the company and going public and whatever. And next thing you know, they're chasing money, right? And they all are doing it. They're all doing it. You, my friend, you, my yeah. friend, are the only one in the shoe business that I'm aware of that has stuck to your guns from the gate. Yeah. There's nothing on that wall right now that I'm going to see that's going to have a 33 centimeter stack height and, you know, or some crazy ass thing going on on your wall. And I, I got, applaud you. I applaud thank you. you. Well, look, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Um, there's two reasons. One is we have no corporate overlords telling us that we need to chase the money, and the second is, you know, my wife has a great line. There's enough shoe companies in the world. You don't need any more, unless your shoes change people's lives. And when we started hearing people say that from day one, um, we knew that if we changed anything about the DNA of our product that would go away because we know the research. The research backs up what we're doing. And the research says if we stray from what we're doing, we're going to lose those benefits. So why would we do that? And the irony, of course, is that what we're doing is not new. This is what human beings have been doing since the beginning of human beings. The modern athletic shoe is the intervention for which there is zero proof that it is in any way beneficial. And by zero, of course, I mean none. And but, yeah, fact, you're singing to the choir. I'm, I'm, I'm I know, totally on board with you. Yeah, yeah. So, and and listen, and this is my problem. This is the dilemma that I've had. You know, I would suggest a particular shoe that I like because the way the shoe was designed was on point. Right. And then they spun off and did all kinds of other crazy crap. And I have a client, by the way, I had a client, uh, he's in Singapore, a marathon runner. He, he, I don't know how they find me. I have clients all over the world, by the way. The yeah. so guy reached out to me, he's from Singapore, and he said that he had not been running, and he's a marathon runner, because he'd been injured. And reoccurring injuries and the PTs and all the soothsayers never found a solution because nobody looked at the way he was moving. So, Oh, wait, i got to pause right there. Yeah. In the early days of the barefoot running movement, which started in 2009, early 2010, mostly as the book Born to Run became popular, right, right. there was all these doctors who were going, hey, I love this barefoot running thing. I'm seeing more patients than ever. I've put my kids through college. <laughs> and I said, okay, a couple things. One, you guys said the same thing in 1974 with the advent of the modern athletic shoe. So which is it? And what's really happening is as more people try something, you're just a bigger population. So it's going to increase the number of people who have some sort of problem when they come to you. But more importantly, let's talk about the problem. You're saying that it's because of barefoot running. Did you, A, ask these people, were they actually barefoot? Because I guarantee 90% of them were not. And if not, then did you ask them, what shoe were you wearing? And most of the minimalist shoes in 2010, 2011 were no more minimalist than, you know, than this thing. I mean, they were using the language, but they're not providing the benefits. I said, third, um, did you, do you know how to analyze their form? Because it's not about the footwear, it's about the form. Right. It's just that certain footwear informs the form. And I said, you know, and last but not least, did you watch video of them running and, and actually analyze their gait? And of course, not one doctor said yes to any of those questions. I said, so then I don't give a crap what you're saying. You're clearly uneducated right. and you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, and there's one other thing. If there's 100,000 people who try something and you're suddenly seeing, you know, a lift in the number of people who are having problems, do you know what the total number of people were who are not having problems? Because no one goes to the doctor to go, hey, guess what? I don't need you. I cured my <laughs> fill in the blank. And, yeah, and well, last but, wait, sorry, last but not least, obviously this infuriates me. Last but not least, is did you compare the injury rate of the runners that you're seeing to the injury rate of runners in traditional footwear? Because that hasn't changed since 1974. It's about 50% of runners, 80% of marathoners who get injured every year. So if we're not, if, if the people running barefoot are having a lower injury rate than that, despite the fact that you may be seeing more patients, we still won. And what I can tell you is Nike put out a study about three years ago that they funded, they designed, they call it independent because someone else did it, where they tested their best-selling shoe against a new shoe they had developed. And the best-selling shoe injured over 30% of the people in 12 weeks. And the new shoe only injured, only injured 15%. 
now they're really good marketers and the way that study was promoted was new shoe reduces injury rate by 52 percent instead of the way it should have been promoted nike proves their shoes injure people i mean imagine well, going to a running shoe store where you say i need a good shoe and they go well here's our best seller yeah, uh, one yeah. out of three people are going to get injured in the next 12 weeks no, oh, believe oh, me, no no I, no no i don't want that i mean i'm not making a shoe and i'm not selling shoes and I, I, I don't do a very good, good job idea. promoting shoes because I don't commonly trust the manufacturers. Right. So the brand lets me down every stinking time. Every time. Every so, time. So uh, getting back to my story about the guy in Singapore. Sorry. So I go to work and I change the way he runs. And I recommend to, to him a particular uh, ultra shoe. And injuries go away. Running comes back together. He's back. He wasn't even going outside. He was staying on a treadmill. If I was a street, it was too hard. So I, I'm like, right, look. So I got him back outside. I got him yeah. running. I got him, got him uh, training for a marathon. Yeah. And lo and behold, one day, I mean, we do a v- virtual thing, you know. So lo and behold, one day he comes on. He goes, oh, man. Oh, man. He was so despondent. And it's like he had a black toenail. I'm like, that's unheard of. I've not seen a black toenail and I can't remember how long when people change to a better shoe and, and run better, right? In better form, yeah. So he goes, well, I'm wearing the shoe you told me. I said, are you wearing the same shoe that I put on? He goes, well, I don't know. He goes, I, I went and got an Ultra. And this, so I said, let me see it. So he literally puts it up on the screen. I said, that's not the shoe that I put you in. He goes, well, it's an Ultra. I said, now that is exactly why I can't recommend the shoes because you just go on your own accord and you find some dumbass shoe yeah. And, you know, and it's, you're listening to the marketing ploy that's played into it or, or what ends up happening is you got a friend that's a good athlete, performs well, he's wearing some fuddy duddy shoe. And so it must be, you know, the boon of his success is because he's wearing that particular shoe. This is, this is one of my favorite things is that that aspect of the marketing of footwear is um, I love it when someone says, well, you know, the guy who just won the Boston Marathon is wearing this shoe, so I need to wear that shoe. I said, the guy who just won the Boston Marathon is a 105-pound Kenyan who's hoping to make enough money by the time he's 34 to support his village for the rest of his life. You're a 230-pound guy who runs half the speed that he does. Um, how, how does that make any sense? You know, you're not going to buy the same clothes he's wearing because he's, you know, oh, weighs, weighs yeah. half of what you do. Yeah, I know. So, believe, believe me, Nike's the devil. Nike is the oh, devil. Un, we, yeah, we're preaching to the choir. Um, <laughs> in both, we're both the choir. We're both preaching. <laughs> we have dual dual yeah. roles here. It it really it really is amazing. Um, Elliot Kipchoge, for people who don't know, he's the guy who ran the sub two hour marathon under perfect conditions and then ran barely over two hours in Berlin where he had set the previous world record um, at 201.40. And, and uh, he had an article that came out about a year ago. Nike had been promoting like he ran that because of our shoes. And uh, Kipchoge came out with an article saying, no, it was because of my legs. That article got squashed. Yeah. Well, I actually did a podcast with uh, another runner, somebody I'd worked with, the 223 Marathon in Boston. And uh, we talked, the, the, the theme of the podcast was, what if Iliad Khashoggi had run barefoot? Don't you, do you know, do you not know um, Phil Maffetone's book, 159? I don't know that book. I know Phil. So Phil wrote a book um, called 159 with the whole idea of what you would need to do to run a 159 marathon, uh, you know, without some crazy situation. And basically nice, smooth, flat surface, bare feet, bottom line. And the only, and, and people say to me, well, how come people don't do that? I go, because we don't have the millions of dollars that it takes to fund the, first of all, to convince someone to do it because they're currently making a living doing what they're doing. I would never tell someone to change everything you're doing if your livelihood depends on it. So to find someone that we could work with who has the ability to run, you know, 205, 210, uh, and then get them out of those shoes and work with them for a while to get comfortable and find the right race, uh, you know, it's a multi-million dollar project. We're not that big of a company. Someday we will be. Um, Someday someone's just going to try it anyway, whether it's, you know, again, that's, our company that means not bare feet, but the closest thing there is, um, and the only and the only um, I'm flashing back to Ron Hill who won the 10K in Mexico City barefoot, and someone said, "Why'd you run barefoot?" He goes, "It was the lightest shoe I could find." 
no. you know, and, and in fact, my, I, it's a really interesting question about people wearing the new, you know, Nike 4% shoe or whatever, which is a misnomer. The guy who did the study on that shoe said it improved people's VO2 max by 4%, not their performance by 4%. And so Nike riffed on that and lied about what the study said. Um, and, but anyway, people are talking about why people are running faster in this shoe. And the real reason is mostly placebo effects and dealing with the central governor theory, which is the idea that your brain is constantly regulating how fast you can actually run to keep you safe. Right. Um, and you can reframe how your central governor or how right. you respond to the central governor, et cetera. But uh, Jeffrey Gray, who's got a company called Helux, they do footwear analysis. He, he came up with a really interesting theory about why people may be running faster in this shoe because not everyone does. And that is, A, it's really lightweight. So it's lighter than what they've been wearing. So maybe that's less effort over time. So that could be helpful. And they're really, really high. So if it's light enough that it doesn't change your cadence, but it's high enough that it's giving you an extra inch worth of stride length, then that makes you faster. So, you know, the, the thing that's so funny to me about the question of are these shoes good for performance is, um, how does this go? Uh, wait, I lost the thing. Um, oh man. Um, I had the thought, it just popped right out of my head. Uh, fat, cane, fat. Oh, um, the, the shoe companies aren't saying why they think it is. They've been completely silent about why that shoe might make someone faster because all the theories are complete nonsense. Right. Um, and seeming footwear experts, I'm going to be using a lot of air quotes while we're talking. Yeah. Seeming footwear experts have said, oh, there's a carbon fiber plate. It acts like a spring. Nope, doesn't act like a spring. That's not how springs work. I've been teaching physics since I was 14. Trust me, not a spring. Oh, it's a lever. Nope, not a lever. Lever needs a fixed end and a fulcrum. There's no lever. Um, oh, Nike says, well, you know, they made it so the shoe rocks you from heel to toe better. Uh, nope, watch Kipchoge running, never lands on his heel. So, I mean, it's all just hand waving and nonsense. And no one has come up with a theory that actually makes sense. And of course, the other issue with that shoe is once, and back to your point, once somebody wins a race in a shoe, everyone else who's like in the top, you know, 10 or 15 near that guy, they own it. Has to buy that shoe because they're terrified that that is the reason that he won. <clears throat> So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that comically changes every couple of years when someone comes up with some new something or other. And whenever, you know, big shoe company comes up with some new thing, which is always padding arch support or motion control, um, they never say, here's our new thing. It's amazing. By the way, sorry for about the crap we were promoting for the last five years. We thought that was good. We were totally yeah. wrong. Well, you know, what's, what's, what really chafes my hide is on social media, you know, everything comes to light. You know, yeah. so the people that I know that are posting pictures of them running or little bits of their race and whatever, I see all this all the time. And a lot of these people I know and have worked with. Yeah. So if you stand in front of me long enough and we're having this conversation about proper mechanics and why, and I'd like to believe if nothing else, I'm logical. If I, if I don't, if I can't get you to understand and believe what I'm telling you, then right. the conversation is useless. Right. So. Yeah. I will show them, I will physically show them with their bodies that they would be in a better place when they change. And I had a guy, by the way, I had a guy in here just the other day and he was wearing those stupid Nikes you're talking about. Yeah. And this guy was supinating so bad on the outside edge of that shoe because he had dug a trench, you know, into that soft EVA. Right. And so it's teaching him to stay in that position and was plagued with injuries, right? Plagued with injuries. I would not even allow him to get on my treadmill wearing those shoes to, to do a gait analysis. I said, you, ne you need to take your shoes off. I said, I can't yeah. watch you run in those damn shoes because you're hurting I'll, yourself. I'll and tell I you something funny. I, well, I'll tell you something finish. funny. So about I can't Sorry. let you, I said, I can't let you do that on my watch. Right. So I will pull him out and put him barefoot and show him video of how smooth and yeah. seamless he's running. And, and so he's like, you know, so where I'm going with this is that, let's say fast forward six months, I see somebody out there wearing, uh, you know, a, a heavily padded a hoka or something like this, and I'm like, what happened to the conversations we were having? What happened to the truth that we revealed? I'll, I'll tell you something about that. There are two things. Um, one, when you said chafes my whatever uh, hide, um, you reminded me the phrase we used in college for some reason was chaps my wazoo. So, um, uh, so there's that. Um, regarding regarding foam breaking down, which it does the moment you start wearing it. And in fact, the reason the carbon fiber plate is in the middle of the shoes is because if you didn't have it, that foam is so unstable, it would shear instantly and you'd you know, ruin a $200 pair of shoes just walking to the track or walking to wherever you're walking out of your house. 
Um, the um, this social media joke. I'm in the Denver airport. There's a guy on the walkway in front of me wearing big, thick padded shoes, and he had the opposite. He'd worn out the inside, so his feet were like this. And I immediately pull out my phone and start videotaping that. I put it on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, everyone's going, oh, I can't believe how horrible these shoes are. On Instagram, everyone's saying, I can't believe you're body shaming that guy. <laughs> body shaming? I'm shoe shaming. I'm not, I'm, even, I'm not even showing this guy above the knees. I don't know what you're talking about. But regardless, I have an answer for why people are doing what you said. There's a couple. Um, I have to tell, I'll tell the story this way. Uh, Dr. Irene Davis does an no, event called The Science of Running Medicine. I know her. And we're, of course, um, she is the godmother of natural movement and minimalist footwear, mostly minimalist footwear. But anyway, um, she does this amazingly lucid presentation showing how the modern athletic shoe, just like you were describing, causes problems and how just getting out of that shoe for many people instantly solves 90% of them. And the other part is a little bit of gait retraining and a little bit of, you know, making sure their glutes are working because they turned off their glutes by wearing high heel shoes. Anyway, she does this presentation <clears throat> brilliantly laid out. Couldn't be more logical. Data, 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 data. And out of the hundred people in the room, on a good day, 20 of them will come and talk to me about what we're doing because she recommends what we do. And the other 75 will walk out the door and nothing changes. And I said to her one day, um, why do you think that is? And she said, well, maybe it's just about time. I said, no, some of these people have come and heard this lecture of yours 20 times and nothing has changed for them. Why? And she was stumped. I said, there's a couple of reasons. One, human beings do not change their beliefs based on data. If they think they made a rational decision to begin with, if you give them contradictory data, they will use that to believe in even more strongly, regardless of their own experience sometimes. Secondly, their identity is wrapped up in what they've been doing and saying. And there are not a lot of people who have the, whatever kind of ego structure it is, to say to their patients and clients, I just learned something new. I've been mistaken. Here's what I'd like you to do to help you out. My, I was an all-American gymnast way back when. My coach, who has coached a bunch of Olympians, brilliant guy, one of the best teachers of any kind I've ever met. His understanding of psychology of just humans, let alone athletes, is so amazing. I mean, one of my favorite stories he told me, we're still good friends. He said, um, if I've got someone in the gym, one of my kids, and they're being kind of just not going to be functional that day, I make them my assistant. I go, you're not going to work out today. You're going to help me teach. And suddenly they're, you know, they're the best behaved people in the gym. And he just, you know, that's the kind of thing he thought of naturally. Anyway, one day um, a Russian coach said to him, if you just do this with your hands, whichever thumb is on top tells you which way you should do a round off. And he had all his girls do this. And he found that most of them were going the wrong way. So, and he looked at the data about why this actually is true. So he spent a summer taking Olympians and saying, we're only going to do round offs for the next two months. We're going back to the basics, the stuff you did when you first walked into the gym, however many years ago, the parents lost their minds. What are you doing to my girl? She's on the path to becoming an Olympian. And now you're having her like go back to the basics. Within two months, they were 10 times better than they were before they started because they were doing something that was in line with what their body was kind of wired to do instead of arguing with their body in a way they didn't even know they were doing. And so there are very few people who are willing to say, I was mistaken. Here's a thing to do. And the other part is if they haven't had the experience themselves, they're more reluctant to make a change. I remember being on a panel discussion the 12 years ago, and it's all these physical therapists and whatnot, like a couple hundred people in the room talking about making the transition to minimalist footwear. And they were all saying it could take years. I said, have any of you ever run barefoot on the pavement for a mile? And no one raised their hand. I was the only one. And I'm a sprinter. I don't like running for a mile. I, I do the hundred meters, man. I don't. I don't even take turns because I don't have a GPS watch. I'll get lost. So, um, because they haven't had the experience, and I'm not even suggesting that they run in shoes like ours. Just put them on and take a walk, and see what happens. Without the experience to then back up, that makes them question what they believed. I mean, this is really the holy grail. Because people believe what they've been hearing from shoe companies for 50 years, the only way in is to get them to reflect on a personal experience that calls into question at least one of the things they believe about having, you know, footwear that's, that looks like, you know, like one of these. And if they 
if they get curious about one thing, then they're willing to kind of go down the rabbit hole and find out more and more and more. I did a, a pitch for potential investors and I showed, you know, a, a normal shoe. And I said, I'm going to show you what's wrong with this shoe. And everything I'm going to show you is going to make you think, oh, that makes sense. Like, you know, when I hold this up and go, you have 200,000 nerve endings in the sole of your foot. That's to feel things. So your brain knows what you're stepping on or stepping in. How much can you feel through this kind of foam? They go, oh, nothing. They go, yeah. So what's that doing to your brain and your ability to move properly? And everyone goes, oh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I hold up a shoe. I go, is this the shape of your foot with this pointy toe box? And they go, no. I go, then why are you shoving your foot into something like this? They go, yeah, it doesn't make sense. They go, you elevate your heel. That messes with your posture, puts strain on your ankle, your knee, your hip, your back, wherever is the weakest one, that's where it's going to show up. Why, why would you do that? Oh, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense. Your feet have more bones and joints than a, you know, a quarter of the bones and joints of your whole body in your feet and ankle. Joints are supposed to move, right? They go, yeah. I go, if you support joints and don't let them move, what happens? And they go, they get weaker. I go, that doesn't let your foot move. Arch support doesn't let your foot move. They go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And some of them will still not believe me. Yeah. In part, admittedly, because I look like this. Yeah. Because I don't. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. in part because I don't have the letters MD after my name, even though I was a pre-med and went through that whole program and just decided not to do it, um, even though most doctors are no smarter than the average bear. I mean, well, you know. yeah, look, so, so look again, you know, everything you <laughs> explained to me is my day to day, right? It's like I, I deal right. with this. I only difference between what you're saying is you're selling shoes I don't. And, and right. so when people come to see me and believe me when I tell you, I've been doing, well, you, you probably know this, I've been putting on clinics around the United States for over 10 years now. And uh, I typically will get, well, because of the nature of what I do, I can't keep more than 15 people in a group because I do clinical diagnostics on them and it takes too long, right? Got so it. um, it's a weekend affair. Testing is like a day and a half. Then I get the gait analysis going. Then we physically go out and start training, whatever. But where I'm going with this is that almost... Every time I do a clinic, I will have the group take their shoes and socks off on a natural surface and have them run. Yeah. After I've shown them how I wanted to approach the run, and, and then I just let them run. And I didn't even tell them what the agenda was. I just wanted them to do it. I have never once, ever once had anybody say, you know, since you had me do that barefoot, man, my foot is killing me. My, my, right. my calves are killing me. So people that were having issues with plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, all these kind of things, they didn't appear to have any issue whatsoever when they ran barefoot. Right. I have done it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, New Jersey again to do a clinic, and it's going to be bad weather. I did it, uh, I don't know, probably about four or five years ago. We went to a track, and there was probably about seven inches of snow. I mean, you couldn't even see the track. There was so much yeah. snow. I said, everybody take their shoes and socks off. <laughs> and they looked at I and mean, they live in New Jersey anyway, right? And they thought this guy is out of his mind. And I got him out there running around the track barefoot in the snow. Yeah. And, you know, only really at that point it was just for fun, you know, because they 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 you know they used to joke because whenever somebody comes to see me, I'm barefoot. Someone would be disappointed if they came to see me yeah. and I was wearing shoes, right? And and so I said, okay, everybody's gonna get barefoot. I've done it a million times. And never ever has it been an issue. So, well, we're I'll tell you the one time. The one time it's an issue, and two things. Um, Dr. Bill Sands, who used to be head of biomechanics for the U.S. Olympic Committee, he was working at uh, Mesa, what's now um, Colorado Mesa University. They gave him a million dollar uh, human performance lab to play in. And he, the first thing he would do when runners came in is he'd, he'd film them on this giant treadmill, 10 feet long, five feet wide, super fun. Put you in a Mission Impossible harness so you don't fall on your face, um, and film you at 500 frames a second from the back and from the side, and then have you take off your shoes and just look at the difference. And people are like, oh my God, that's like a totally different thing. Then he has you try on every other shoe that you own and see how close it is to barefoot. And what we found is that, because I spent some time in his lab, is that 90% of the people, when they take off their shoes, their form is instantly better. And the ones for whom it's not, it takes like 30 seconds of intervention 30 seconds of giving them a cue or two until they're having, until they have better form. And the only time I've, uh, what happens with people is they'll, I, I had someone during one of those panel discussions say to me, you barefoot guys are going to say that if anybody gets injured, it's because it's a form problem. I went, yeah. 
I mean, and there's one of two, the only thing that was causing problems for people is a, if they have this idea, you're supposed to land on your toes. So they overstride and plantar flex. So they're putting a lot of force, not only on the metatarsals, but eccentric loading on the calf and the Achilles, which is problematic. Or if they're used to this idea of towing off at the, um, uh, um, after ground contact, where they're just pushing off the ground rather than lifting their foot off the ground, rather than using the hip flexor to get the foot off the ground. So that extraneous force in the calf can also cause some problems. And the other, the last but not least one is if you're wearing, I watch this, my neighborhood has a lot of world champion runners. It's really, really very fun to watch them. Um, except for the fact that, you know, they're wearing a shoe like this big, big high heel. They land sort of midfoot or forefoot right underneath their center of mass looks beautiful, but their calf, their heel can't come all the way down to the ground. So their brain has basically learned that they have this much range of motion in their Achilles when they actually have 20%, 30% more. And so they're going to get pain that they will attribute to being something like Achilles tendonitis when it's really just that they're applying extra stress in that last bit of stretch in the Achilles because their brain has told them that's as far as you can go. And for them, if you know anything about Feldenkrais work, there's fun things you can do to trick your brain into getting back into what's natural when your brain has learned to limit motion. And so it's, that one's a really easy one to resolve. And the first two as well, very easy to resolve. Don't overstride and plantar flex. Don't you know push off the ground because that's not doing anything anyway. That whole toe off idea evolved from having a stiff shoe where you kind of feel like you're having to do this thing with your toes, but it's not making you faster. It's not applying more force in the ground. You know, no, most people have never looked at force plate data, what it looks like when you land, go to mid stance and take off um, and what you can and can't change there. And there's just all this mythology about, you know, what happens about getting more fo- guys who have, um, there's a company, I'm not going to mention them my name because that would be too obnoxious. They have an insole that they say does act like a spring. And I go, great. Aside from the fact that it's not true because you're never loading your foot in a way that loads that thing in a way that would be helpful. If it were a spring that was actually beneficial, you could see it in the force plate data. There'd be a, so it, instead of a normal looking bell curve, it would be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It would be shortened on the far end, on the takeoff side, because it would be propelling you. There'd be a traditional force and you'd be getting off the ground faster. So just show me the force plate data. And of course they have none. So they're misusing right. physics, just like every other major shoe company, to sell an idea that's complete bullshit. So, so the, the problem with this conversation is that you and I are accustomed to having people in front of us that we feel like we am compelled to convince that they're completely wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. Yeah. So, so I want to go to I want I want to cut to the chase here because there's a okay. couple things I wanted to co- cover. So, I mean, the physics thing, you know, we could do this all day long, and I'll, we'll just nod our heads at each other and just like, <laughs> yeah. You, I think they have things that you put on your dashboard that do that, right? That, that right. Pop your head around. Head. So, three shoes that okay. that got my attention recently. Yours. Uh, the 360, okay, yep, the 360, like it. Um, the Forza is the tra- trainer or the runner. Pookie, uh, well, That's the you trainer. can't run in the trainer. Well, well you can, but hold on, let me move things. So is, you can see. is it stiffer? So you, you can run in the trainer, um, but it's slight. It's slightly heavier. Um, it's really designed for like, you know, lifting, cross training, lateral motion stuff. The runner, which is just designed to be a road running shoe. So then there's the runner. So it's more like a sock with a sole attached to it. Okay. So here's the, here's the dilemma. So, and I, we talked about this before we went live and I wanted to share this with you. There's a new sport that is born out of, uh, Germany. I think it's out of Hamburg, Hamburg. It's a functional fitness competition. It's called High Rocks. Before, when you finish with me, I want you to look this up because you're going to be amazed. So, um, actually, one of my clients is the current world champion in High Rocks competition. And uh, so, the way it works is it's an indoor competition. Okay. You, ru- you start by running one kilometer. It's like a closed okay. course. And you end up at a skier, Concept 2 skier. 1,000 meters, one kilometer run come back and you do a sled push and a sled pull. And the, I'm, I don't know if it's in chronological order, but you do a sled pull, a sled push, a farmer carry, uh, a lunge walk, um, the ski erg. Um, and, I'm, and I'm probably missing something. Then there's the wall ball, which is, you know, yeah. 100, 100 repetitions on the wall ball. 
but it's it's so what it is it's it's a, a one kilo, it's eight one kilometer runs oh see so yeah, i'm out from that but okay with with eight exercises um in between each run got it the, the current world record is, is about um 50 i'm not absolutely certain i think it's like 57 minutes now so here's what's going on and i have clients i'm, I'm coaching for this now and by the way, this is all over the United States. I'm going to the na- uh, the national championships in uh, Chicago in February. So wait, so Hyrox, how do you spell it? H Y R O X. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna get a kick out of this when you see it. So yeah. it's high intensity running with these exercises blended in, and um, it's on fire right now. It's it 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 was awesome. starting to take hold then, like everything in the world we had the pandemic so it got shut down nobody's competing it's resurgent and it's coming back so there's been uh there's chicago uh new york la several times houston it's all over the country now but the world championships i believe is going to be in the uk this this year uh so it's big in europe it's big all over the united states now so here's what's going on right the sled push is uh, for the men is about four hundred pounds on the sled, and there's no age grading, correct? Yes, there is. But, Ooh, okay, now I'm in. All right. Okay, so so the point is, um, these guys pushing the sled are coming out of their shoes. Yeah, yeah. So they're all oh. the, <laughs> hello. Trainers. So I'm Trainers. going there. So they're they're all kind of ferreting around to find the shoe. That's not going to cause them when they're in that, yeah. pos- that 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 sprinter's position, pushing on the sled, to have their heel come out of the shoe. Yeah. And yeah. I just, by the way, before before we got, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Before <laughs> we got live here, I texted my client, and I told him, I said, dude, because he was asking me what shoe should I get, because I was pulling him out of those Nikes that we were talking about. Yeah. I said, uh, he goes, I'm pulling my heel out of the shoe and whatever. I said, dude, I'm going to have a conversation with the owner. Uh, or the, you know, the principle of zero shoes yeah. in two minutes. And he, he said, have good luck with the conversation. So, well, so here, here's the thing. Uh, this all gets me so excited. Now I have to joke or I have to say, as it's going to sound like a joke, everything you just said about high rocks, I love, except that, you know, multiple time running one K because as a sprinter, you know, that one K is way farther than I go, but all the rest of it, I'm a power guy. So I'm all in. Uh, that'd be terribly fun. Um, literally almost anything we make would work. It's really more going to be about the surface and the soul for that. So the Forza trainer would be, I mean, almost anything. So what I'm going to say is I'll just send you guys, you know, some things to play with and you tell me what you like better. It's kind of funny. We have a bunch of professional golfers who train in our shoes they each the ones that i'm thinking of five different guys they each swear by five different shoes so um there's a personal preference component because of everything we do is so similar in terms of natural movement light weight flexibility etc so you kind of can't go wrong if there's a bunch of lateral motion and it doesn't sound like anything in this it is then i'd say definitely um like there is the no lateral trainers, motion. there is not zero so with no lateral motion i would say even try the speed force because it's so light that's going to make a big difference or the well, HFS. I like, I like the strap. I like the strap over the ankle and support. We have the- that. Well, so in the speed force, same thing. So yeah. it's got the heel slash instep strap. It has the lateral strap. So same idea. This thing weighs a men's nine is like, like five and a half ounces or something. And we have a new design. Well, this so just, this is going to make you happy. They're going to Chicago and these guys own six training facilities, right? And <laughs> They're so bent on competing and training in this fa- fashion that they have a hundred competitors going to to Chicago. When, when? I'm there, there'll be a hundred of these guys that are competing, and when these guys it? are the these guys are the owners of those clubs, and these guys are the leaders that draw these people in. So I'm gonna I want to stick these shoes on, my God. And, yeah, you know it's going to be kismet. It's going to all of a sudden you're going to have a bunch of people wearing. That's going to be super, super fun. Um, you know, what you're, what you, what it sounds like, it's like a better version of, you know, the CrossFit games. Um, although it actually, you, you gave me a funny flashback, Reebok, way back when, 1980, when did I graduate high school? 1980. Um, so is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, 1982, 83, I think they were doing the fittest man in the world competition. And a guy who was on my gymnastics team, who was a year or two older than me, 
uh, named Donnie Hinton. Donnie won it like three years in a row. And it was things like what you described. You know, the, the last event was getting on a life cycle and every minute they crank up the resistance and it's how long can you go? Yeah. And the first year they covered Donnie, in addition to being a phenomenal athlete, he was freakishly good looking. The second year they kind of covered Donnie. The third year he won, but they didn't cover him because not only was he a great athlete and freakishly good looking, as an athlete during this competition, he couldn't have been more boring. He just kind of head down, did it and won everything. Pat there was, was no drama. Time. Yeah, no drama. He's won. <laughs> but what you're describing sounds great. It's like, you know, OCR races and obstacle, obstacle course and Spartan races. I love the idea of all of the everything except all the running part because people think sprinting is like, you know, a 5K. It's yeah. like, well, oh, so oh, that, okay. let, let me let me expound on it. So now um, Spartan made an attempt to purchase High Rocks. They looked at it and they said, well, this is going to be hot. We want to buy it. The Germans said, no, nah, we don't no need way. you, right? Yeah. So Joe DeSena and his, you know, the, the type of guy that he is, they decide, well, we're going to make our own event. So they create something called DecaFit, which is half of the distance of almost the, all the things that they do doubled up. So instead of a one kilometer mm -hmm. run, it's a 500 meter run. Right. You know? So everything is kind of babied down. And now that's got competitions almost in every health club in the United States. And there's a there's a lot of similar similarities in the competition, but it's not exact. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. To protect the innocent, right? You you haven't seen my world my world record triathlon, have you? No, I did a triathlon in five point five seconds. <laughs> so you have to look it up. Just look up world's shortest fastest triathlon. So I I dive into a baby pool. Uh, and then I jump on a little kick scooter for like two kicks and then I run, you know, two feet to the finish line. Nice. So it's, it's, I mean, it's the only triathlon you can do 10 times during lunch. Right. And, um, but, uh, you know, it is funny. I mean, sprinters, we're an unusual breed and, um, and for us, you know, like 500 meters, that's a marathon. So even that is really pushing it. People, I love when people say things like, how fast could Usain Bolt run the mile? I said, here's the thing. Usain Bolt would never run a mile. That's not what we do. You don't understand. No, no I worked. So. I worked with some sprint. I had two clients. One was at USC, and one was at UCLA. These are top flight, going to the Olympic athletes. One of them runs a hundred. One of them's the the guy that I was working with runs a hundred, and the girl I was working with runs a two hundred. When right. she was fourteen years old, she was the fastest woman in the world uh, at that age. And um, so I get the whole sprinting thing. You know, we'll do like uh, repeats on my high speed treadmill for five seconds, about three rounds and have to take five minutes off Yeah, and yeah. or go out and puke about five or six times before we can go back to work. <laughs> yeah. They just don't have their energetics are completely it's a whole different thing. Different. Yeah. yeah. Now I've had this argument with people. In fact, I, my favorite time that I have this argument with people is about diet when they go, oh, you know, paleo is great. I go, there's not one power athlete that I know who is on not on a high carb diet because that's how we live. And they go, what's well, going to kill you? It's like, yeah, maybe. But either way, it's not going to matter. I did, I, I, someone put me on a very low carb, high fat diet just as an experiment. And I, and at the end of a couple of weeks, I, I called the guy and I said, Hey, I just did something during a workout that I've never done before. He goes, Oh, what's that? I went bailed because I couldn't get off the ground. <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, th there's two shoes I so, covered. Okay. So, so for those two, well, look, there's a bunch of stuff that's relevant for what we're talking about. So offline, you know, we'll put together. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, people. right. Yeah. So, but point is, is I, I, you got my attention when I saw the Forza. I said, these yeah. guys want something like that. Now, if you have some iteration that's going to make a better move, we'll visit it. Okay. So the yeah. next thing, and, and I, I don't remember if we talked about this before we got on live or after, but we talked about the fact that when you do get into a broad toe box shoe training, then it's got to carry over into the shoes that you wear around the, the day, right? Well, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it, I'll make it weirder and worse. Okay. So um, we're going to come back to once you get used to letting your feet do what's natural, you don't want to do anything else, and your right. feet might change shape and make it so you can't wear something with a pointy toe box because right. it's so screamingly obvious that doesn't work. My wife actually said to me one day, I hate that we own this company. I said, why? She said, I've been looking for a nice pair of brown boots, and I found one that I love, but it's got a quarter-inch heel, and when I put it on, it feels like I'm going to fall on my face. So, um, But what I'm going to suggest to some people who've been listening to this and maybe in the category we talked about before – of hearing all the information, hearing all the data, but not changing, great, don't change, kind of. So there's research showing 
that if uh, this is from Isabel Sacco in Brazil, she took a couple hundred runners, half of them did an eight week foot exercise strengthening program. And over the course of the year long study, that group had a 250% lower injury rate than the people who didn't do the strengthening program running in regular shoes. Interestingly, um, there's research from Dr. Sarah Ridge showing that you get the same benefits from that as that strengthening program from just walking in shoes like zero shoes. In fact, she says that you'll get, you should get the same benefits from zero shoes as the shoes we used in our study because we didn't have the shoes for her at the time. Now, there's not a study yet showing that if you walk around in our shoes, use them for active recovery and just casual use, that will build strength that will reduce your risk of injury because you just haven't done that study. But it's the same equation. It's like Walking in these shoes builds foot strength as much as this exercise program. This exercise program reduces injury. If that makes sense to you, you know, there's a there there. And of course, I will confess to people who th find that compelling that there is an ulterior motive because they will find, this is the second part of that conversation, that once you get used to walking around in these, even just casually, one day you're going to put on your regular running shoe and go, ah, that's just not right. Yeah. And then it's going to be a little transition to get used to wearing these or, or what's going to happen is you'll wear these casually and have to run to catch the dog or run to the mailbox or whatever. And you're going to go, Hey, wait a minute. And all I'm going to say is, right. What you just discovered is what people were doing for 40,000 years prior to 1974. People forget, I'll stop this rant, that someone did the analysis on Jesse Owens and suggested that if he was running on today's track surface, he'd be barely slower than Usain Bolt. They leave out uh, Delano Merriweather, who ha still has, from 1971, the world record in the 100-yard dash, because after he set that world record, uh, they switched to meters. But he ran a nine-flat 100 yards in big, thick spikes on a cinder track surface. That translates to about a 975, 9800 meters. That would make him the fourth fastest guy ever. Yeah. David Epstein did a... Um, that was a he did the analysis for, for uh, right. Jesse Owens. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I, it was a fascinating... Uh, uh, I think it was a, uh, was it a 10X? But I, yeah, he, he, I remember it was, a, it was a fascinating conversation because he also talked about some other things that were pretty bizarre. But so where I'm going <laughs> with this, where I'm going with okay. this is that um, I can't put on shoes that you would go out with because they don't make one. I mean, I'm sure there's some out there, but harder and harder to find. I yeah. looked at your new Denver because now it's, by the way, we're going to have, I know you're getting weather too right now, but we're going to get like, it's supposed to be two degrees here. I moved to Tennessee. So I'm in Tennessee. Two, that would be dreamy. It was negative 14 when I took the dog out this morning. <laughs> well, look, I, I don't play. I, I'm not a, I'm not one of those cold weather guys. I, I give that Neither up a long time. I, I was raised in Michigan, left Michigan to Maui. We've never been there before. <laughs> never been there before. Never lived there. Doesn't have any friends there. And I literally gave everything I owned away. And I moved to Maui because I was just tired of the snow. Love and it. then living in California for 30 years, all of a sudden now I got seasons. I'm like, what yeah. is up with this? So, yeah. <laughs> we, so, but we, anyway, we, the, the long yeah, story yeah. short is the Denver is uh, something that I could see me wearing with a pair of jeans. Well, we've got two shoes coming out in the spring and the spring is crazily only a couple months away. Um, so, holy crap, I just realized December, January. So basically eight to 10 weeks from now, I don't know the exact date, we're going to be launching two new shoes that are dr casual and dress casual that you'll really like. I'll show them to you later. All right. I don't have them on the wall behind me. Um, and and maybe even one or two others uh, that will work. So the Denver's a brilliant cold weather boot. These other shoes, one, uh, you'll see. Th this is part of the line that we're expanding for a lot of reasons. It's just, the reason our product line has expanded the way it has from a do-it-yourself kit when we were on Shark Tank to 30 different styles of casual and performance boot shoes and sandals is because once customers get used to having their feet do what's natural, letting the body adjust to that and showing, getting all the benefits of that, they keep, they'd say things like, oh my God, I need another shoe for the following thing. I need, it started out like our do-it-yourself kit. I'm not going to make my own shoes. I need a ready-to-wear version of that. I'm not going to wear sandals in the winter. I need a closed-toe shoe. Um, I need something to wear at the office. I need something that's slip resistant for the hospital they work in. That's that one right there. Um, so it's been driven predominantly from our customers saying, I can't wear anything else. So now I need the following. And that's what we do. Now, some of those projects are super challenging. I'll confess one of them. We have all these people who are construction guys or in various ways need a work boot to make something that's got a protective toe that has something that lets you stand on a shovel or a ladder 
that gives you um, and still gives you natural motion is a very tricky Venn diagram to get that overlap. And so we have someone working on that full time because there's nothing like that in the world. Same thing for uh, the military, same thing for firefighters, same thing for police. The, the shoes they have to wear, you know, want to hear something this crazy. The Las Vegas shooting, um, and I might be getting parts of the story wrong, so my apologies, but my memory of this is the guy who ran down the shooter started running and the shoes he was wearing were killing his feet so badly right away, he took them off and chased them down in his socks. So, you know, we want to make things for people to make them more functional and make them healthier and give them a lot more longevity. Pro athletes, you know, so many of these guys, you look at their feet, it looked like they're stepping on an IED. And so we want to, we know we can solve that problem too. And so, you know, when people ask me, what am I trying to do with zero shoes? I go, I'm just trying to change the world. Something, I mean, just that one goal. And I know it sounds hyperbolic, but we have almost a million people who have experienced the benefits of letting your feet do what's natural. We know what's possible. We know the places where we haven't been able to penetrate those markets and the total addressable market for letting people do what's natural is about $250 billion. No. There's, there's almost no application where letting your feet do what's natural doesn't work. I'll give you one that where it doesn't. If you are a if you are a climber, if you are I was a just going to say, yeah, you that's can't like do the, it. you know that's one of the or you know it, uh, if you're doing ballet on point. But I mean, there these are these very specific <clears throat> cases where you're going to deliberately mess up your feet because you're getting a benefit that you can't get in any other way. Right. Totally, totally cool. Now, even that, even that said. What's so funny, a guy that I was uh, talking to recently was in Nepal and was heading up to Everest Base Camp, and he's in these you know big, thick, whatever shoes, and the Sherpas that are with him are a pair of flip-flops. So there is a way of even doing some of that crazy stuff with natural movement, but the amount of time that it's going to take to adapt and adjust to that is right. longer than what most people are going to put in. Right. Well, I totally get it. Yeah, but I mean, let's, let's face it. It's like we're on a general scale. I, I, I'm with you. I, I think that... Um, Everything we discussed so far, you know, I told you we're like these yuckheads. I know, the I know. But um, I, I need you. We've done it. You, I, I need a company to start developing shoes that are also not unappealing to look at, because we're so accustomed to looking at a particular type of design of a shoe. Correct. Correct. To to just get about their day and 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 be fine with it because yeah i have a by the way i, I will confess i have a pair of ultras that they made it was like a casual shoe uh i saw it and i thought oh broad toe box and it's not like a, a running shoe and i bought it and yeah so it's been my go-to shoe when i have to wear shoes you know meaning in the populist yeah with jeans or whatever and they i don't think that they um they, uh, they, it's cut it. they don't make it anymore they cut it, they cut it. Yeah. Well, so what, what so what happened to Ultra? Just to let you know, there were sort of two phases because their original products were much closer to what we do. I know. And then and then uh, they didn't have the money to bring in the inventory, and they I don't know how they connected with. Um, so the the founders are friends of mine, but I can't remember how they connected with the company Icon Fitness that owns Schwinn and a multi billion dollar company. They put up the cash to bring in the inventory and took. I think they bought like 98% of the stock. I mean, really took it over. Um, so Icon was giving them some direction that led them in some places that did not pan out. Uh, and then they most recently got acquired by the VF Corporation, who immediately brought in guys from Saucony to run Ultra. And basically, they've taken Ultra and they're turning it into Saucony Light or Saucony 2, something like that. So they narrowed the line. They're focusing on performance. But they changed it, so now there's you know big thick padding. In fact, they just came out with a shoe that's you know a giant maximalist padded shoe. And when I got the ad, I emailed the founders and I said, "I'm sure this makes you want to cry even more than me." It's yeah. it, and again, it's you know it's it. On the one hand, they think they're chasing the money that it'll be easier to sell more of these when they make that. On the other hand, they just lost seventy five percent of their customers. Well. I, I don't, you know, the financial end of it, all this, I don't know. I'm just a little guy out there in the road that's <laughs> identified that physics is real. And yeah. if you if you really want to have some longevity out of your body, that you should not cripple yourself up from the ground up. Yeah. And, and so I don't do it. And, and I can tell you that uh, 
I, I won't tell you. We've, we beat that to death. But I like your Denver. I uh, One day when you have the new shoe, I'm going to have to take a hard look at that. Uh, we need to take a, a hard look at what High Rocks is doing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When you get off this thing, I want you to Google it. Oh, uh, it, it's already me, in a, it, dude, it's already on a browser tab. Believe me when I tell you, you're going to go, oh, shit, this is cool. Yeah. And, and, and I, so I've been coaching OCR athletes, marathoners, triathletes, almost predominantly for the past, I don't know, so many years, a decade or so. Um, and High Rocks just is like, it's novel. It's like two and a half years old now. And uh, I now I'm getting more, a lot of my OCR people are, are going off, they're, they're fed up with OCR. And they're yeah. moving into uh, these high rocks competitions. Uh, and OCR, I mean, OCR. Look, you and I are both old enough. To remember uh, Network Battle of the Stars? Yeah. yeah. O- OCR is a lot like that. So you know, there's there's like some goofy things that you do. So you know, there's I mean, there's fun obstacles and whatever, but it's not that kind of challenge that certain kinds of athletes. I'm one of them. Uh, really like where you know it's not just it's like okay, climbing a wall, jumping over a wall, yeah, whatever. But really putting yourself to the test in some combination of power, um, the cardio part is tricky for me, but um, uh, power and strength, uh, though, you know, that's a whole different game. That stuff's really fun in a way that people, if they haven't tried it, they don't know. And once you try it, it's like, oh, this is good. And it's, and it's more fun than like when I, did, when I went to a CrossFit box um, and they're going, taking me through a, one of their workouts of the day, one of their wads. And they're, you know, like yelling, like, go for it, go for it. I went, yeah, this is not a real competition. You can't get me excited about a fake competition. I mean, yeah, I'll try and do better than I did next time. But this is not that interesting to me. High rocks, yeah. that, I mean, other than, again, 10x, uh, 1K, you know, that's got my name all over it. That sounds yeah. like a blast. Yeah. So for me, because, uh, you know, clinical analysis has been my game for 30 years. And so I, what I do is I, my competition is with fatigue. And, Interesting. And, and all of the athletes I deal with, I always roll back into what is causing you to fatigue and what we can do to overcome fatigue. So the only the only metric we can compare, you know, lactate production is obviously a big one. Sure. Right? So it's something I could focus on because I can correlate it against heart rate. So, you know, doing the clinical diagnostics and looking at their thresholds and identifying where they're starting to have problems and seeing what I can do to change that. Is yeah. what I do. And then the mechanic part of it with the running is critically important because if I can cause them to be more efficient, we lower the cost of work, we lower the, the and or so developing the tolerance. So um, the high rocks thing falls right into my belly with very nicely because these guys are lit. I mean, they, yeah. it, you, you could because I'm collecting data from them and I'm looking at where their heart rate is, what the recovery looks like, what their pace is doing and trying to figure out, you know, it's like a Rubik's Cube for me. I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. The problem with OCR is that it's ever changing. They, the, the distance right. is different. Where they uh, put the uh, the uh, the uh, different That's obstacles awesome. is different, yeah. Yeah. and so it's it's really kind of hard to dial it in. Like triathlon was easy to run, swim. Sure. You know, sure. it's easy to figure out. Um, and so High Rocks has kind of given me that back. And and there's not that many. I mean, everybody and their brother now is a coach. Uh, <laughs> And and I have a yeah. little bit of trouble with that, which I'm not going to bore you with because, you know, you know, just like when you get excited and get a little pissy with it, that's me because I, you no, know, no, look, you're, look, you're look, 30 I'm, years old and you're now you're now you're no, you and my, I are the same. My my dad had a line, um, you know, it, it was a couple. One of them, he was a dentist. He said, uh, "What do they call the guy who graduates last in his class in dental school? Doctor." And his other his other version of that was eighty percent of the people in any profession really aren't qualified to do it. When it comes to coaching, you know as well as anybody, most people just don't have eyes to see. They just can't. They're not seeing the um, essential factor, the core factor that makes something work. Like my all time favorite air quotes again, air quotes favorite thing is when I hear some track coach yelling to his kids, "Knees up!" It's like, oh god, you have no idea what you're talking about. Or, so, re- or stride, over stride. They teach you to yeah, over Yeah, reach, reach. It's like, yeah. So, you know, I mean, even a coach that I worked with, who's a former world champion runner, he was saying to me, we're doing a particular drill. We're doing like, I'm trying to remember what it was. doesn't really matter. We're doing some drill. And he was saying, oh, um, when you're in the air there, you've got to get your hips over your toes, your feet more. 
I said, I'm in the air. It's too late for me to do that. What you meant to say is that I'm not taking off in a position in a way that puts me in the right position when I'm in the air. You just went one step further. Now, what that said to me was he was just regurgitating what his coach said to him. And he was, for whatever reason, able to do that thing without knowing what he was doing to accomplish that. So he's just repeating this cue sure. that had no value. No, and I then I showed him the right cue. And it's like, oh, yeah, that, that works. Yeah. Well, anyway, so this was great. Uh, yeah. I, I told you that I was going to circle back to you. I apologize for it being so long in the tooth to do it, but, um, I, you know, here we are. And now this is in my house as opposed to yours. Um, and that's great. Um, so we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk. Yeah. About. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been an absolute blast. Look, um, there are, there's a handful of people on the planet who understand the stuff the way that we're talking. Um, you have way more experience coaching than I do or will ever have, although I gotta, I'm got i going to tell you something about that offline. Um, uh, and it's wonderful. But, you know, it, and to your point, just because you keep highlighting this one about shoe companies who change their thing, we have a couple people who have, um, who've taken like one of our shoes, usually the Speed Force, actually. Uh, and I'll drop names, Peter, Dr. Peter Atia and David Weck, the guy who invented the BOSU ball. They own 40 pairs of that shoe because they loved it and they wanted to make sure that if anything changed, it was all going to start okay. It. Right. And so we, we, we redesigned the upper of that shoe for next year. And so I emailed them and said, first of all, tell me what you like, if you like the looks of it, uh, because you're the one who owns more of these than anyone on the planet. And happily, they both went, oh my God, that's awesome. So uh, that made me very happy. 